opportunity to share God's word. My name is Jeff McNeil, and I'm the young adults pastor here. And so we haven't had the opportunity to meet. Hello. Hello. I'm glad to meet you. Before I get started, I just want to get a couple, um, just a little details and, and hellos and thanks out of the way. First of all, um, welcome back, Pastor Bill and Miss June. Uh, we honor you all, and thank you for going and spreading the good news. If you didn't know, uh, we support prison ministry in Africa, and so Pastor Bill um, has, the, has the ability and, and really has the heart to go there and to sow seed into the chaplains that would be ministering to people that find themselves in prison and give them hope and show them what life in Christ looks like. And he is there working, not vacationing, working and doing such incredible work. And we're so grateful to hear that their trip was blessed and that their time there uh, was just good. And so welcome back. We love sending you away, but we more love sending you back home. So welcome back home. Uh, also want to uh, just say hello to my friends Derek and Rachel. From, they're from that faraway land that I used to live in called Iowa. And they're down here visiting. So I'm so glad to have you guys. We love you guys. And I'm glad that you're with us. And then, uh, of course, if you're watching online, uh, good morning. And thank you for being part of our church campus. If you watch online, we consider you part of our church family. So thank you for joining us. Let us know whether you're watching live or later on a replay uh, that you're with us. Comment and let us know that you're there. Share this stream with somebody so that they can join us at church today. Okay. I think I've taken care of all of that. Who's ready to dive into God's word? Yes. Amen. Well, let's pray. God, we thank you that you're here. Father, I just thank you that your presence is tangible. God, we, we know that you're in this place. And Lord, we're just ready to receive. We thank you for the word that you will speak to the power that it has in our lives, that it comes to life through us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the second and final week of a little two-week mini-series we're calling When I'm Broken. And we've been looking at the life of a prophet named Elijah and how God used him in such a powerful way at that time in history, how God had used him in, in such incredible ways where he had helped to bring a young man who was dead back to life, resurrected his life. And we saw last week where there was a, a duel on Mount Carmel where he stood up to the false prophets and God rained down fire from heaven. It was just incredible, powerful, supernatural move of God. The same God that did that yesterday does it today and will do it tomorrow. Like it's just incredible all that happened in the life of Elijah but then he had one moment that broke him. And that's how our life can go many times. Life can be going good. Life can be blessed. We can be just really just floating on air. And then one thing, one moment, one text, one bad report, one difficulty that just seems to crash everything down. And this is what happened to Elijah. And now all of a sudden we see Elijah in 1 Kings 19. He is responding irrationally. He literally runs 100 miles for his life. We see him just leave his calling. He no longer wants to do what God's called him to do because he has one threat from one evil queen who says, I'm going to kill you. And now all of a sudden he forgets everything that he is and he forgets everything about who his God is. Elijah breaks. Breaks so much so the scripture tells us he wants to die. And so the reality for all of us that we need to understand is that we have breaking moments in our life. Life is hard. It's heavy. It's real. We're in a fallen world. We have an enemy who despises us. And sometimes we just don't make good decisions. And so we face heartache and trouble and difficulty. The question that we ask ourselves, and I ask you today, is what do you do when you find yourself in a moment of brokenness? And prayerfully through this series, we'll see how to respond, how faithful our God is, and what we can and should do when life gets hard. Because Elijah left everything. He, he was done with one hard moment. He was overcome by fear. The struggle was real in his life. And my first point in your handout today, I hope you will follow along, fill it in, and prayerfully it'll be a help for you when you find yourself in situations like this, is that breaking moments are a war of faith and fear and one will win. Faith is real. Our faith is real as well. Fear and faith are both real. One is going to win in our lives. When life gets hard and heavy and difficult, when we get those moments where we're just like, I just feel like I'm breaking, one will win. 
What do you do when you get to that moment? How do you respond? When, when you face trials and difficulty, heartache, struggles, when you're concerned, when there's uncertainty in your future, how do you respond? Do you worry? Do you get anxious? Does that anxiety lead to depression? Have you been in a dark place like we see the prophet Elijah? The prophet Elijah is in this place that he is having suicidal thoughts and words. Do you, have you ever found yourself in that place? What do you do when you feel like you're going to break? You see, we have the responsibility to respond. Because fear is real. But you see, God calls us to in the midst of all that we are challenged by to do something different, to respond differently than how the world responds. To, to fix our focus and our eyes and attention in a different place. To begin to feed and encourage our spirit in a different way. To turn to worship and let that be the sound that comes out of our voice and let our attention be fixed in heavenly and in high places, not these places that we struggle. You don't have to stay in your fear. We can learn from Elijah to see this is what happened when fear broke him, but we don't have to do the same. Fear fixates on what might happen. My God, what might happen to me here? How might this turn out? How hard is this? How horrible could this be? But you know what faith does? Faith focuses on what God will do. Someone today needs to realize, yes, it could be bad. Yes, it could turn out horrible. But our God is on the scene and He's got a different outcome for your life. He's doing something different. He's doing something good. Yes, my, my bank account might be drained. I could face disease in my body. I could have a loved one that I care dearly for be lost. How are you thinking about these situations? And what are the words that you speak about it? Because Scripture tells us that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But where are your thoughts when difficulty and brokenness and heartache arrive? Where are your thoughts? And, and listen to this, check this out. The Bible says that the power of life and death are in your tongue. What are the words that you're saying? Because they're doing something. They're not just meaningless. It matters how we think and what we say when life gets hard. And I'm not trying to, 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 to pass over or, or to make something less of what you're going through. It's real. It's a struggle. It's hard. It's heavy. Fear grips us in some point, in some way. All of us at different times in our life. But I'm saying, how are you responding? My wife and I have the opportunity to work at the local school district. I work part-time there and here at the church. She works full-time as secretary. And, you know, school life, man, it, it is so enjoyable. It's fun. It's full of life. There's lots going on. But it also has teenagers. Amen. And teenagers can be challenging. <laughs> nervous, insert nervous laugh, right? But if you've ever been around teenagers, like you, you see the potential and all the good things, but you also have to deal with the stuff. You know, you know what I mean? The stuff. And so when school starts and we've got all these meetings and all the things happening and everything going on, like there's stuff. Okay, stuff. Follow me? Stuff. And so I found myself when Brittany would come home in the afternoon, I would you know, say, hey, how, how was your day? How did it go? And our conversation pretty regularly was going to the hard things, the difficult things, the frustrating things. And I really was convicted by God because I was the one posing the question and kind of leading the conversation. Why are you fixating on all the hard stuff? It's real. It's real. It's, it's not going away. We're, we're going to work through it, pray through it, deal with it. But God asked me in my spirit, what's good? And so I don't even know if my wife has noticed, but the last week when she gets home, you know what the first question is I ask her? What good happened today? What good happened today? Amen. Church family, what is good in your life? Amen. Look, struggle is real. Heartache and frustration is real. Difficulty is real. I'm not asking you to ignore that. I'm asking you to begin your thoughts, to put your hope in what is good in your life. Yes. Amen. And maybe a more important question is, who is good in your life? Yeah. 
Because when you've got God, you've got goodness in your life. You've got something to be praying for, thankful for, praising God for. I've got hope, life, and salvation in the King of Kings. What's good in your life today? Elijah forgot as he broke what was good and more importantly, who was good in his life. And this is why I love, you know, you know, Scripture is so helpful in our life is it just shows us a blueprint of, of how to do things. And we see areas that people fall short in and, and not to come from a place of judgment, but to say, what can I do differently and how can I learn from that? I love the realness and the rawness, but also the faith of David. You talk about a man who went through some stuff and whose life was lived out on the pages of Scripture. And we see how he deals with heartache and difficulty and challenges. I want to pick up in Psalms chapter 22 just to see how this might look different when life is hard and we find ourselves in a breaking moment. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2, David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you know that the words that our Savior cried out on the cross were actually penned by David in Psalms? Why are you so far from me, from saving me, from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, can you feel the heaviness in David's spirit? I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Is David denying what's hard? Is David pretending that there's no struggle in his life? No, he's, he's being real. He's crying out to God with him where I am. Nothing is hidden. He's got the same emotions. He's got the same challenges from Elijah who's running from a death threat on his life. Same challenges, same issues, same pain and emotions. We'll continue in verse 3. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not Put to shame. David's attention turns from his heartache, his trouble, his emotions, his frustration to a place where his good God, his faithful God, his present God is at. And I want to focus on one important word in those five verses that we just read. I don't know if you caught it. The word is yet. Your God is a yes God, but also a yet God. The title of our message this morning is, is not over yet. You see, I love that word because there's so much hope in that word. There's so much potential in that word. There is something developing that is going to happen when that word arrives on the scene. Something is still to come. And last week we talked about how our brokenness is actually a bridge to God's healing and to His help. That bridge is God's yet. It's the bridge between where I'm at and where I'm going with God. It's who I am and who I'm becoming with Christ. You see, there's a yet in all of our lives. And I wonder who today could say, yeah, I would have been hopeless Yet, God, I would have been anxious. Yet, God, I would have been overcome with fear. But yet, my God intervened. My body would have been broken and sick, but yet my God healed me. I was destined for separation from God forever in hell, but yet God loved me so much he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. There's a yet in the middle of our need. Can somebody praise God and thank him for just a little bit to say, yet my God has intervened in my life. He's a yet God. And maybe you haven't seen it in your life, but I'm here to declare for someone who's believing and trusting God, it's not over yet. Amen. It's not over yet. Elijah and David were both broken. Real. But Elijah was traveling down a hopeless highway. And he thought that hopeless highway ended with his life. David is on the same hopeless 
highway, but he turns right at a righteous intersection where his yet God is there to take him to a new destination. And someone today who is feeling hopeless needs to realize that you can continue down that path of despair. You can continue to just live in all of your dysfunction and frustration, but there is a turn that can be taken toward a righteous God who redeems and restores and gives you a new ending for your life in Christ. Because fear screams what God isn't doing. God, where are you at? God, why have you responded? God, why have my circumstances not changed? Fear yells it, but faith declares what my God is going to do. He hasn't done it yet. But my faith believes for the yet moment of my life. And it's not just motivational talk. It's just not some words to make you feel better. It is a covenant God who loves you and who has promises. All of, they are saturating your future. Just all over them. If we will get in line with what he says about us and who we are in his son and the good plan that he has for all of us, if we will get our heart in line with what God declares over us, it will change the way that we live and we see our life. I don't have to stay broken. I don't have to be overcome by fear. I don't have to believe the bad reports that come across my life. I don't have to do that. And that's why the confession of faith is so important for your life. What are you saying about who you are in Christ? What are you saying about your kids and your grandkids? What are you saying about your identity? What are you saying about the authority that you have in the name of Jesus over your body, over your circumstances, over the evil that comes against you? What are you confessing about who you are? It's the confession of faith that needs to be the words that we speak. We should have a song of praise continually that comes and flows out of us. Worship should be the atmosphere that we live in. It should just be what and who we are. I'm telling you, if you are not in the Scripture, and if you don't have Scripture everywhere that you look and that you turn and that you see, you're missing out on something that you need for your life. Put it on your walls. Put it on your screensaver. Put it on sticky notes. Write it on your hand. I don't care where you get it. Get the Word of God everywhere that you go and put your heart and attention and focus on that. Remember His faithfulness. Remember who He is. Because when you declare who God is, see, in the midst of what I'm going through, this is what David does. In the midst of his struggle, his, his, struggle, his, his difficulty, his heartache, in the middle of it, what does he do? He turns his attention and declares who God is. And when you declare who he is, you move from broken to believing what he yet can do. Amen. What can he yet do in your life that you need him to do? This is what happens when you declare who he is. And this word is so powerful because it's a, it's a conjunction word. It literally is that bridge as I talked about. It's a, it's a word that takes, takes two clauses and two sentences, two, two things that would seem not to have any relationship with each other. They become bridged together with this word, yet. Because David sees and declares the way things are going to be. I'm under attack, but yet my God is with me and for me. I'm hurting, but yet my God, my God is my healer. I've received a bad report, but yet my God speaks a different truth over my life. I'm broken, but yet my God restores me and makes all things new. You see, there's a yet in the middle of your life. And that's why as we look at our life in this picture, there, there's where I'm at. There's me, and there's this move of God that I'm believing for, waiting for, reading in Scripture, believing for in my life. All that we are waiting on is the yet. Just because we haven't seen it yet and just because He hasn't done it yet doesn't mean that it's going to happen. I trust that you will begin to put your faith and your hope in the yet moment from your God. Because in a moment, in an instant, in just a move of God, things can change in your life. And faith says it hasn't happened yet. Your life's not over yet. Your circumstances are not for the worst because God is on the scene and we are going to see His yet. 
Again, I don't want you to just think we're trying to give you motivational church talk just to make you kind of feel better when you walk out and then life just hits you hard and you're like, okay, I, I don't know what the preacher was saying because I'm not seeing it in my life. I want to give you five reasons you can have faith for your yet. Five reasons that you can have faith for God's yet in your life. And number one, God's faithfulness isn't contingent on my performance. Thank God that I don't have to impress Him because I fall short regularly. Thank God that He is not keeping account of how often I go to church, how much I prayed, if I open my Bible today and He moves based on my performance. I thank God He's not like that. Because my Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You think I was performing very well when I was living in my sin? A life far away from Christ, you think I was doing very good, but yet God looked at me and saw me and loved me and delivered me. And I didn't have to perform for it. Because when you begin to think, if I could just be good enough and just do enough things and impress God enough, that's religion. And God doesn't work that way. Because as we pick up this intersection of Elijah's life, you see, Elijah's on the run. He's left his calling. He's forgotten who God is. He's ran away from everything. His faith is zapped. But yet we see that God meets him, pursues him. Goodness and mercy, aren't you glad they're coming after you? Yes. Aren't you glad that it's chasing you down, that you can't outrun it? Yes. First Kings 19, 4 and 5, it says, Then Elijah came to a broom bush, and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the bush and he fell asleep. I don't see any evidence here of Elijah doing anything positive in his faith. I don't see anything happening here that he is pursuing God with his words or even his heart. Yet, yet right there in that broken place in his life with his faithful God was there. Because God's grace gives us what we don't deserve. Yeah. And because of God's mercy, we don't get what we do deserve. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for that. And when I don't have faith, when I, when I don't have faith, my God is faithful. If we are faithless, 2 Timothy 2.13 says it like this. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, true to His word and His righteous character, for He cannot deny himself. I've got good news for someone today that walked in feeling unworthy, feeling like I've got things in my closet that don't need to come out and that God is judging me in a way that he could never love me. You don't have to earn anything from your God. Look to him, turn to him, give your life to him and see what he won't do. Amen. You can't be good enough. The Bible says that our actions are like filthy rags, but praise God with life in Christ, I don't have to be good enough for him. Just drop that trying to be good enough and find your life in Christ. He's the faithful one. Number two, how I can believe God for my yet moment. God's supply fills my every need. Man, we are so, you are so needy. Look at your neighbor and say, you're needy. You are really, really needy. All right, now in all fairness, look at that same neighbor and say, I'm needy too. All right, let's just get on the same page here. We are all needy people. We have needs in our life. And look, life tries to convince us that the needs in our life can be met and filled with something else. That relationship that I think is going to make me whole. That thing that I think if I could just take or consume that could numb what I'm going through that peace that I feel like I need, that accolade that I need to achieve, that position that I feel like would make me feel better. Look, you are needy, but there is only one who can meet every need. But I've got good news for you today. He meets every need in our life. Amen. His supply is enough for our needs. Elijah's needy. He has no hope. And also, the guy's been on the run for 100 miles. He, he, he's in need physically, too. Let's pick it up in 1 Kings 19, 5 and 6. All at once, an angel touched Elijah and said, Get up and eat. 
And he looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. Elijah had need in his life, and his God was the supply that he needed. And we all have needs in our life. We have physical needs, but look, we also have our greatest needs, which are spiritual needs. I need encouragement in my soul. I need peace for the craziness that's this culture today. Craziness. I need it. I need salvation in life in my Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. I am needy. And so Elijah got up in 1 Kings 19.8, and he ate and drank, and strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Elijah's need was filled, but it wasn't just a physical need. You see, he needed the presence of his God. He needed an encounter with the one who had resurrected a boy, who had sent fire from heaven. He needed that in his life. And God knew what he needed, and he delivered all that Elijah had need of. And the world thinks that all the times that, that you, you get what you need, that, that something somehow just you know, happens in your day, or that someone blesses you in a way, the world says, oh, that's just coincidence. I'm here to tell someone today that God is concerned and moving even in the smallest details of your life. Amen. He sees you and your need, and He delivers on what you have need of. And I thank God that he is so faithful to look down from heaven and see, oh, I need this today. Oh, he's in need of this tomorrow. He sees our need and he gives us what we need. It's divine favor. you got God's favor all over your life where you're in Jesus Christ. You've got all that you need. And more importantly, when you have God, you have all that you need. I believe there's someone within the sound of my voice who is thinking in, their, in themselves, if I could just get to this, if I could just get to this position at my job, if I could just get to this point in my life, if I could just get into this relationship, if I could just achieve this, accomplish this, receive this, if I get these things, now I'll have what I need. Wrong mindset. Wrong mindset. Because there will always be something else that you need. There will always be someone else that is achieving more than you. Look, if you have God, you have everything that you need. Amen. And that's what Elijah needed to know. Look, Elijah, your life's on the line. You've been threatened. You're on the run. But you have God. You've got what you need. You don't have to worry about all the other things. You don't have to be concerned with all the details or how this is going to work out or what might happen or what, how this is going to end. If you've got God with you, you've got what you need. Amen. You're going to have to go through some stuff. You're going to have to encounter some things. You're going to walk through some stuff. But your God is with you and you have all that you need. Oh, but come on, Jeff, you don't know my situation. No, I don't, but I know my God. Amen. And so that resolves it for me. That takes care of everything that I need to know. Let's just look at what's happening in Philippians chapter 4 with a man named Paul who finds himself in prison. And from prison, Paul is talking in a way that seems like it makes no sense because Paul says, I want to give you these instructions, church. I want you to rejoice always. Paul, you're in prison. Church, I want you to not be anxious. Some versions say be anxious for nothing. Paul, you're in prison, my guy. It's like he's gotten delusional with his time in prison. He says, I want you to be thankful and pray always. Paul, do you not get it? Your life circumstances are not good. What are you rejoicing about? What are you thankful for? How are you not anxious because you're behind bars? Because Paul knows he's got what he needs. He's got God with him. Amen. Elijah, you are running for your life. You are afraid someone has threatened you. That is real. But Elijah, you've got God. You've got what you need. And someone today is dealing with a health report. You're dealing with a family dynamic. 
you're struggling in a certain way, I want to tell you, you don't need to have resolution there because you've got God and you've got all that you need. Remember, he's a yes God and also a yet God who intercedes in every need that we have. And from prison, as Paul says, rejoice. Don't be anxious. Find peace in God. He says this in Philippians 4.19. And my God will liberally supply, fill until full every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. How can he say that? Because he knows he has what he needs. Number three, how can I trust God for my yet moment? God gives us supernatural peace in the midst of life's problems. I've started to learn that even though my circumstances may not change in that moment, that I can not only see them and experience them differently, I can live them differently because of what the work that God is doing in me. Because the power of His Holy Spirit that helps me. 1 Kings 19, 11 and 13, now as a Elijah has been fed and met by God, he gets these instructions. Let's read it. The Lord said, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and it shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard it knowing that the glory of God was on the scene. He pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and he stood at the mouth of the cave. And a voice said to him, What are you, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why, why are you on the run? Why, why are you forsaking your calling? Why are you not remembering that I am what you need? And in the midst of loud Big, crazy, threats, violence, culture, difficulty, health reports, finances, all the struggles of this world that just scream at us. Scream at us. In the middle of that, Siri knows all about it. In the middle of all that, there's a voice that speaks peace. And that peace is found in His presence. When your life is the hardest, you need His presence the most. Amen. Elijah's life was the hardest it had, ever, it had ever been. Are you going through a hard season of life right now? A season of life that causes you to want to just quit and give up. A season of life that may cause you to want to, to, to leave your family, to leave your church, to leave your faith. To give up on everything. Are you in that season? That is the moment of life that you need your God the most. The most. The most. We need Him the most. Because in the midst of all that, I'm telling you, if nothing else changes, I can have faith in God and know that His presence is what I need. And I can have peace in the midst of the storm. And chaos and confusion and heartache and difficulty and pain. I can have peace in my spirit because my God's enough. And that's why from prison, Paul says, when you give thanks and rejoice always, the peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, that exceeds all understanding. It doesn't make sense how God's people are so peaceful. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense how they walk so confidently through the hard times of life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense how they walk into that surgical room believing God when the doctors don't know what to do. It doesn't make sense when they believe for their kids' salvation when they are far, far away from Christ. How are you not going crazy? Because the peace of God that exceeds all understanding. Humans don't understand it. It doesn't make sense how it happens. The peace of God will keep your hearts and your minds safe in Christ Jesus. How does he do that? Number four, because he's intimately close in our times of need. I 
thank God that his presence never leaves me. I thank God that he will never forsake me. I thank God in the midst of all of this thing that we call life and this journey in this fallen and broken world. He's close. And that word intimately is intentional because it just, you know, you can be close to something but not in relationship with it, not caring for it, not acquainted and familiar with it, not to cherish it and call it special. You see, your God is not only close to you, but he calls you special and cherished. You're his. He is intimately close in our time of need. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul is in prison. And there's something incredibly powerful that happens in the words that he pins. Because Paul says, rejoice, rejoice always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And Paul says, do not be anxious for anything. And sometimes I can look at my circumstances and say, Paul, how can I rejoice right now? I, I don't know how I can do that, Paul. Paul, how can I be anxious for nothing, Paul? I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how. But look, in the middle of that, it's so intentional what he says. Between those two declarations are four powerful words that I want to share with you today, no matter where you're at. He says four words. The Lord is near. How can I rejoice, Paul? Because the Lord is near. How can I not be anxious, Paul? Because my God is near. He's near. Psalms 34, 18 says it this way, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Man, how, how more broken could you be when you want your life to end? Elijah, on the side of that mountain, the Lord is close to you. And he saves those whose spirits have been crushed. So thankful that God is so close in my time. And look, there is nothing that can get closer to you than the presence of God. Nothing. Nothing can get between you and God's presence. He is close. My last point, how can we believe God for these yet moments in our life? Because God is yet victorious over whatever we face. Whatever. Whatever. I hope that word whatever is powerful enough to, to, to take care of the situation that you're in. Whatever we face, the name of Jesus is above any and everything that we face. That's why Jesus can say, in this world you will have trouble. Don't be surprised that you face difficulty. But take heart. Be encouraged, church. Jesus Christ has over overcome the world he's overcome the sickness that you're facing he's overcome the heartache that you're going through and experience his name is above everything that you are working through and dealing with in your life he has overcome he is victorious and whether it has happened or it is yet to come christ is above it all Amen. and we are in christ and you know what is just, man, God is so good. You know what is so incredible about Elijah's life journey. He is on the run for his life from a threat made from an evil queen. He is on the run. Not only 